Please welcome your panelists for U.S. Politics, What's the State of Our Nation, moderated by Executive Chairman of Guggenheim Partners, Alan D. Schwartz. Well, hello, everybody. The clock's already ticking down, so I think we better get started <laughs> using into our time here, and we've got a lot to cover. So what we're going to cover today, you know, we talked about the state of American politics, and what we've agreed is that there's a lot about politics that people want to talk about in, in every aspect of it. But we believe that the most dysfunctional part of our political system is actually our Congress and the inability to pass any bipartisan type legislation. In fact, just to set it up, if we could pull up slide four. Slide four, what this shows very starkly is that whereas the process that we had in this country where the two parties would get together periodically and pass landmark legislation, i.e. saying there is something that the country needs to do better, and we get together as two parties and we do something for the good of the country, that has pretty much gone away. And now, the only time you can get legislation of any significance is if one party or the other controls Congress, and then they have to hope they can pass legislation that the other party won't repeal when they get into office. And so, this is what we're here to talk about is, how did we get here, and what can we do about it? And so I'm going to start with uh, my friend Senator Corker. And Bob, um, I remember, you know, very much a, a, a moment um, probably six or seven years ago where I turned to you after we'd been in a meeting and I said, you know, I, I really just want to tell you that I really want to thank you for being such a voice of reason uh, down there in the Senate. And you said to me, and I said, thanks, but, you know, I'm really tired of being a voice. I'd really like to be able to get something done. Mm -hmm. And I know you said when you came into office that you were going to stay for two terms, but some of us thought we might talk you into a third term uh, back a while ago, and now you're sticking to your promise of leaving after two terms, but could I just ask you to start off is what we just saw on that slide, the inability for two parties to come together, yes. is that part of what is having you leave, and how do you think about it? No, actually, look, you know, as I said to you this morning in another meeting, I'm a lawmaker, and I don't like laws, right? I'm a, I mean, I've been an executive, and in the position as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, so much of what we do has nothing to do with passing legislation. I can assure you that the way Congress is has nothing to do with me leaving, nothing. Uh, today, we have, we have more talented people, more intellectually sound people today in the Senate than we had when I got there. In other words, the quality of people serving, no doubt we've lost some lions, some of which you know, some of whom you know, but we actually have better people in Congress today than when I got there. And you look at the people who are running this term, I mean, we're going to have, we have some great people out there, so, so it's not the people. You look at the, um, um, you look at the way things used to be, we used to have people in the Northeast that were Republicans that were more moderate than Southern Democrats. And so when people talk about bipartisanship, well, it's changed. Each yep. of the parties are actually more solidified in where they are, right? I mean, think about that. So there's not as much opportunity for bipartisanship. And the big issue, obviously, Alan, as everyone knows, I mean, the, the polar polarization of where we are is what's driving this. And so, look, um, uh, it's a tremendous privilege to serve in the Senate. People see that. They're running for office. We have great people, but the nation is, uh, you know, it's a cliche, is incredibly divided, and that's why you're seeing the vote outcomes that we're seeing today. So that's very and, interesting. And let me just add one more. Yeah, please. The collegiality among members is the best that it's been since I got there. <laughs> and I think part of it is a Trump presidency because it keeps both sides off balance, right? Um, but, but the fact is that people, the collegiality is an all-time high. It's just the opposite of what the American people view on cable television. Which is very interesting, because I just read something to John McCain in his new book, and he was talking about how people in the country think that it's not possible to like somebody from the other political party, voters. 
Whereas he said, I think some of my best friends and people I've learned the most from are a number of senators he would right. name from the Democratic Party. So that's an interesting yeah. process. But I think, you know, this polarization, part of it is how much has, you know, what's cause, what's effect, and how does this cycle keep going of the polarization? And I think I'm going to turn to Catherine, because Catherine, uh, you and I have done some of this before, but you and Michael Porter wrote a, a, a very, I think, you know, insightful piece about, you know, what is happening? Why, uh, why, is, why is this stagnation and polarization come in the political process? And so we thought we'd set up now, you take a little bit of time to, to outline some of the main theses of your report is how did we get here? So we can talk first about how we got here before we start to talk about how we can move forward. Thanks, Alan. So we got a little memo uh, to the speakers at the conference, and it said, make sure you disagree with each other and that you, you know, uh, have a great discussion. So respectfully, then, I'll say we don't believe in our work that polarization is the driving cause. And our work is really long, so let me tell you a quick story to give you a flavor. Um, think back to 2009 when Joe Biden became the, pres uh, the vice president of the United States. His Senate seat in Delaware was open. And everybody in Delaware knew who was going to be the next senator from the state of Delaware. And that was a gentleman named Mike Castle, a former congressman, a governor, most popular politician in the state. But you've never heard of Senator Mike Castle. Because first, Mike Castle ran in his Republican primary. And he lost. He lost to a Tea Party candidate in 2010. And that was it. Except, if you think about it, why was that a problem? It's just the primary. Mike Castle's the most popular politician in the state. Go ahead and be an independent in the general election like Joe Lieberman did years before, and you can win. So why didn't Mike Castle do that, smart man? Because Delaware has an odd law, and it's called the sore loser law. And what that says is if you run in your party's primary, Democrat or Republican, and you lose, you are simply not allowed to appear on the general election ballot no matter what the voters in your state want. And Catherine, how many states in this country have that odd law? <laughs> Such a good question. You might know the answer, but we could turn it out here. I'll go ahead and say 44. I live in one, and so do most cool. of you. And this, this kind of structure exists everywhere in politics. There's a couple other things I'd like you to know about primaries, about partisan primaries. First of all, as many of you do know, the elections are mostly decided in the primaries, particularly in gerrymandered districts, and that tends to move our representatives further to the right or to the left than they would naturally be, and also, most importantly, further to the right and to the left than where solutions are. And additionally, the, partisan pr the influence of the partisan primary often extends to actual legislating, which is to say that when a legislator has to consider a solution to a major problem, like on that chart that we saw from Alan, the operative questions in this business of politics that must be asked by this legislator is not, is this the right policy for the country? Is this what my constituents want? It's actually, can I make it back through my partisan primary if I vote for this? And if the answer to that question is no, it simply doesn't matter what the other answers are because the rational incentive to get reelected directs this legislator to vote no in that particular condition. And additionally, if the legislator decides they want to vote yes, there's always the chance that they are subjected to the change of primary, which used to be a noun, to now being a verb, as in the leadership says, if you vote for that, we're going to primary you. And what that means is we're going to run someone further to your right if you're a Republican or further to your left if you're a Democrat. It never ne means we're going to run a rational, centrist, problem-solving oriented candidate to your middle. As such, the rules of the game affect in our lives and in every organization, the rules of the game affect the way the game is played and affect the outcome of the game. And as Mickey Edwards first said, a former congressman years ago, Washington isn't broken. It's delivering exactly what it's designed to deliver. The challenge is that the rules of the game in the business of politics have not been designed to incent solving problems in the public interest or to benefit citizens. 
In fact, when you look at it deeply, the rules have been designed by and for the benefit of two private gain-seeking organizations, which are our political parties and their industry allies, which together we call the political industrial complex. And the political industrial complex is absolutely thriving. A great opportunity for a political entrepreneur, which is to say, We've got two competitors, a huge dissatisfied consumer, 90% of people don't approve of how Congress is working. Why don't I have some new competition? That would happen in any other industry, but it doesn't happen in the industry of politics, and why is that so? The fact is that the players themselves regulate this industry, and the duopoly has worked very well together over time in one particular way, and that's to rig the rules of the game to keep out new competition. Put another way, politics isn't broken, it's fixed. So in my work with Michael Porter from Harvard Business School, we use tools to look at politics as the big business that it has become. And these are tools that have been used for years to analyze the behavior, the power, the incentives, the functioning of for-profit industries and understand how power and, uh, and wealth is distributed in those industries. And this lens, the use of this lens, which had never been deployed for politics before, actually sheds new light on the dysfunction and, most importantly, provides direction on what would be a co cohesive strategy that could work to alter the incentives functioning in that industry. So uh, I'm going to turn now uh, to Jason. So Jason, I mean, the, the bottom line of what Catherine and Michael have laid out is that, you know, the situation is working for the two parties. This is a duopoly that keeps reinforcing itself. But the only way to really reinforce itself is to pay the most attention to the wings, which are the ones that are going to turn out in the primaries. And therefore, you know, the parties are being dictated to by the wings. If they serve the wings and they don't serve the middle, they reinforce their power. That's essentially what she is saying. So I know that you agree with some of that, but you don't agree with all of it. And we want to get to what you don't agree with. And maybe you could start with the Bipartisan Policy Center. What is it you do? A little bit of background, Charlie, and then where, where, where would you disagree somewhat with this emphasis on the two-party duopoly being the problem? Thank you, Alan. And uh, I guess I should welcome you all to Democracy After Dark. This is a little bit of a different uh, <laughs> mood for these panels. So um, I run something called the Bipartisan Policy Center, founded about a decade ago with four former Senate majority leaders, uh, Tom Daschle, Bob Dole, George Mitchell, and Howard Baker. And the basic idea is just that neither party, in fact, has a complete monopoly on good ideas. And our imagination was that there really are very little, uh, there's very little support out there for folks like Senator Corker, for Jane Harmon, for the people who are really trying to get things done. There's a tremendous amount of architecture to support rigidity on the left and the right. And so what we try to do in many ways is act like um, what a Senate committee ideally would do. We bring people together who have you know, forceful but constructive disagreements. We figure out kind of an evidentiary base uh, upon which we can have a, then a big fight and come out with specific recommendations. And then what we do is lobby for them. Um, we are proud lobbyists. I think there is a, a challenge in Washington that often the people who think the most do the least and somewhat vice versa. Um, so that's kind of our you know, imagination for um, the system. I entirely agree with just the basic premise that um, members of Congress are almost without exception very good people with very bad incentives. And I think I take um, you know, Catherine's diagnosis that we have in fact created a system that has a lot of incentives to push people towards the edges. And I think I probably agree with two thirds of the specific recommendations. Um, but a couple of concerns around the idea that the focus should be on trying to diminish the authority of the parties. I think the first is that we put a lot more attention um, or a lot of additional attention on what happens when people get to Washington. So I think we want to focus on elections, but we also have to figure out how do we enable members of Congress when they get elected to take tough votes that are in fact necessary for the national interest, but might undermine some of the enthusiasm of those constituents on the edges. So for example, the idea of bringing back earmarks, something I'd like to talk about a little bit. If there was one specific, actual, practical thing you could do to increase the capacity of Congress to act in the national interest, I would bring back earmarks. On the question of the electoral system, um, let me just put out maybe the broad frame and we'll get into the details later. 
it is certainly the case that the parties are, um, you know, more divisive. We have more polarization in the country, more dysfunction. It's also true that the parties are weaker today than at almost any time in the last five decades. And so if we acknowledge that we have a lot of partisanship and very weak parties, that could lead you to some conclusions which say we have to figure out how to make sure there's more competition because the parties aren't working. It could also lead you to the conclusion that the parties actually have played an incredibly important kind of intermediating role, organizing different communities of interest and finding ways to have that kind of constructive collision. I think there are a lot of ways, um, often through well-intended reform, that we've actually weakened the parties to our own disadvantage. And I guess I would just kind of end my little opening with um, the law of unintended consequences. I think the chart on the wall is actually the legislative process. Uh, that's <laughs> actually what it's like. You cannot, in fact, diagram democracy. It is an emotional, complex, human experience. And many times when we try to reform the system, we put a very logical constraint on an illogical system. And the results are, in fact, to our detriment. So, you know, we put limits on what the parties could raise under McCain-Feingold, which seemed like a neat idea. And then the next year, we ripped the roof off under Citizens United and said, everybody else can raise as much as they want. So now, the parties are weak, um, but the alternatives are weaker. And so I guess, you know, Pepsi and Coke are a problem, but remember what RC Cola tasted like. <laughs> and just be careful of what you wish for. <laughs> Unintended consequences, that's um, in a lot of areas, that's very, very true. And uh, Patrick, I'm gonna turn to you now, and uh, you come from a different perspective, from the media perspective on this, and media is perceived as um, a big driver of some of the polarization that is going on out there in the country. Um, yeah, some Patrick. others can look at it as saying it's responding to the polarization because that's their customers. So which side of the aisle are you on? Listen, I, I think politics is seeping into everything uh, in our life. Uh, when I was a kid, you watched the NFL, there were United Way commercials. Today, it's you know, become a political football, um, whether it's big companies like Target or Facebook. Increasingly, um, you know, we're seeing the, 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 you know, the politiz politization of uh, our, our everyday life and, our, you know, and, and, and companies. And um, I see politics sort of increasingly pushing out, uh, very tribal. Um, there's, uh, uh, and, and I think really the media is, is uh, at the end of the day, these are businesses for the most part, and um, I think the media is very responsive to their audience. I think uh, whether it's MSNBC or Fox News, um, their, their market is expanding at a very rapid rate, uh, and they're, they are responding to their audience, and they are basically providing information uh, that reinforces their beliefs. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, if you look at media on the left and the right, the exact same event or situation, you, you, you are, uh, they communicate a completely different set of facts. And I do it every day in my office. I, I watch a whole, uh, a number of different networks. Um, so, you know, as for the media, um, uh, you know, people ask me all the time, is it, is it a good time? Uh, and the fact is, it is a very good time to be in the business, but I think the phenomena with President Trump uh, is not unique to the United States. This is a global phenomena. Uh, we're seeing it with Brexit. We saw it with the election of President Macron. Uh, you know, the fact is that uh, across the globe, you know, people are engaging in politics in a way that I don't think we saw, you know, as recently as 10 years ago. And that engagement is actually a very good thing for our democracy, and I think long term. Uh, the alternative is, is, is people dis disengage. Uh, which I don't think is, uh, you, know, you know, for me, I, I don't think is, a, uh, is an appropriate response. I will tell you, Alan, uh, it, we did a survey with Morning Consult. 46% of registered voters, these are people that vote, believe that the media is making up fake news, right? 46%, basically one in two voters believe that the media is making up fake news. And 51%, uh, according to Quint Quimpiac, 51% of Republicans believe and this is a quote in their poll that, that, that the media is an enemy of the state, right? So we, we, have, we have increasingly polarized everything in our politics. And I think that, you know, I, 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 I do struggle with that. But, like, at the end of the day, and I said this to Alan backstage as a media CEO, it's not 
necessarily my job, my role to offer solutions to partisan gridlock, but it is my job, our role at Politico, to offer credible, trustworthy, reliable, and fact-based journalism. And, and never before has it been more important to be committed to the First Amendment so that we have the ability to provide high quality journalism and that you're, you're seeing that uh, you're seeing that evaporate across the country. We have 230 journalists at Politico in Washington that cover one thing, politics and policy, no sports, no cooking, no travel. And people are obsessed with what's happening. 25 million unique monthly visitors come to our site because they care deeply about what's happening in our politics. And I actually think that's a really good thing. It, it, you know, it's been good for our business, but um, I, I actually think it's more importantly, it's been good for our democracy. And those 230 people, they got into this business because they care deeply about the impact of their journalism and the impact that it has on our democracy. And, and so when you see those numbers about the media in terms of 46% believe that we're making up fake stories, that is, that is a really dangerous trend. And I, you know, we're gonna continue to do our job. Our guys are on the wall you know, reporting the facts and, 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 and trying to be a bipartisan, a nonpartisan source of information. Uh, that, that's great. So, Bob, I'm going to turn back to you because I think there's some fascinating stuff coming here. Before we get to the solutions, I want to, you know, I think, you know, it's really interesting, the unintended consequences. So we'll see maybe as we look forward, maybe there's some things coming that we don't see. I mean, you know, smoke-filled rooms and earmarks were like the worst things in the world. And now a lot yeah. of people are saying, you know, maybe, maybe they got it better that way than they, yeah. than they do opening the whole thing up. And something you said, which I always thought, you know, there was a major shift in both parties where in, you know, maybe the 60s and things, you know, Northeastern business type Republicans became Democrat over a lot of issues like right. civil rights, et cetera. Right. And working class, primarily all Democrats, Southern Democrats became Republicans. And mm -hmm. so there was a major yep. shift in the, in, in the way things worked. And that might have been part of how bipartisan it worked, because as it was shifting, right. it wasn't so clear the divide, right? That's correct. So do you, do you see a chance um, as we go forward that the parties may realign and or that actually a third party could emerge? Um, I do. There's been some of the thought leaders on our side of the aisle, um, you know, this is, this is a rhetorical statement. So I know there's, this is a rhetorical statement I'm getting ready to make. But, you know, some people have said, look, we might be better with a parliamentary mm -hmm. form of government. Because even if you look at, even though things are tribal, mm -hmm. they're very tribal. And that's what I mean by polarization. I mean, look at Pompeo the other night in his confirmation all the R's voted for him, all the D's against him. Um, I mean, if you look at the candidate, I'm sorry, there's a little something there, okay? That's polarization. I mean, that's an unusual, for that type of candidate, that's an unusual vote. So I'm going to stick with my polarization tribal as a tribal. As, the candidates out on the trail right now say that people don't even want to talk about policy anymore. They right. just want to know... Are you for Trump if you're on the Republican side, and are you against Trump if you're on the Democratic side? Um, so um, I, th I think the parties are weak. They are weak. You're right. All this outside money. Uh, by the way, I don't think money's the big problem right now at all. But look, the parties have changed, Alan. I mean, look at look at our president. So our president wins an election for a party that used to think that the United States of America was a force for good around the world and we should be involved. That's not his point of view. It's a party that used to believe in fair trade, I mean free trade, not so much now. Used to care about fiscal issues, not so much now. And cared about the traditions of institutions, right? I mean, we, we are a conservative party that cares about institutions. Well, so, the Republican Party is now the party of Trump, there's no question. And it's been totally remade, totally remade. There are still numbers of people who care about those issues. The Democratic Party is still trying to figure out what it's going to be other than anti-Trump. But is there an opportunity for a third party? Um, I think there is going to be a, an opportunity for a third party. It's gonna be easier at the presidential level because of the, the problems we have within the Senate, which committee do you serve on? You know, we're set up as a two-party government right now. 
And so you'd have much more difficulty having a true independent party or middle party because you still today have to caucus with someone. But yes, I think we're moving to a period of time unless change occurs where um, uh, another party is going to emerge that embraces a, a different type of republicanism or a different type of democ democratism, if there's a word for that, or something that merges the essence of the two of them. So let's talk about possible solutions here, and let's, let's talk about process a little bit, because now we're talking about where we are, but what's the processes that get us here? And I want to turn to Catherine on this, and I, I will state I'm on the board of a group, Represent Us, and that's a bit of how Catherine and I got to meet, because we're, we're out there working at a state-by-state -state level on making some changes in the way elections work and some other things. I worry about some, some money aspects and some things, but the one that I'm most focused on is do we find a way? Let me start with this premise, Catherine, and then see how do we get there. The premise is, if you look at it, the majority of the country doesn't identify as either hard left or hard right. And yet, the majority of the candidates that end up coming through Congress are hard left or hard right because of the primaries. So what are the ways that the middle of the country, if you will, and maybe it's the basis of what a new party could be, a more moderate type of person has a chance mm -hmm. to get to and stay in Congress or in the Senate. So do you want to talk about what are some of the things that, that could be done? Yes. Uh, thanks, Alan. And here's where the opportunity comes from. Most of the rules of the game of politics are actually not in the Constitution. They've been made up over time by and for, as I said before, the political far parties. And to transform the system, then, we need to re-engineer these rules of the game. And it's both that simple and also certainly that hard. But with a comprehensive reform strategy, we could make some progress. So if we could go to slide eight qu uh, quickly. So in our work, after we analyzed the business that is politics, we basically took all of the reform ideas that have been proposed and put them through a simple screen which is to say, would this reform be at the intersection of powerful and achievable? And by powerful, I mean addressing a root cause that we identified of the dysfunction. And by achievable, I mean sometime in the next decade or two, as in constitutional amendments probably need not apply. So if it's in that intersection, then that's what we want to go after. Now, one of the things we found, and I should warn you, is that there aren't any reforms at the intersection of powerful, achievable, and easy. <laughs> but nonetheless, we've got powerful and achievable. So let me tell you what those are, and we'll go to the next slide. Our strategy is in four areas, changing how elections are run, changing how legislation, the rules of the game of legislation, some practical steps around money and politics, although I agree with you, I don't think that's where the real game is at. And then a open, opening up of near-term competition. But quickly, I'm just going to talk about the first one, and that's re-engineering the election machinery. We have what we call the election trifecta. And if we implement these three reforms together, we believe this could make a huge difference in the incentives that operate both during the election and during the legislative process. And here they are. First, let's get rid of our partisan primary system, which, in the law of unintended consequences, was originally put in to get the nomination of party candidates out of the smoke-filled rooms and into the hands of people. Mm -hmm. So we can keep a primary, but let's move to nonpartisan single ballot top four primaries. So you go to the primary, you don't vote in the Democratic primary or the Republican primary, you vote in one. All, everybody's on the same primary, everybody's on the same ballot, and the top four vote getters advance to the general election regardless of the party they're in. Then in the general election, we have the second reform. When you show up in November, you have your top four vote getters, and you vote using ranked choice voting with instant runoff. What this means is just like always, you'll select your favorite candidate. But if you would like, you can also say, this is my second choice, my third choice, and my fourth choice. You can rank as many or as few as you want. When the results are tabulated, if after the first counting of all the first place votes, someone has over 50% support, the election is over and that candidate wins. But if no candidate of the four has gotten over 50%, then the last place candidate is dropped. Voters for that candidate have their second choices now counted, and the numbers are run again. 
And this continues until a candidate is elected with absolute majority support, over 50%, which always then results in the election of the candidate who had the broadest support among the most number of people. Finally, we want to combine these two with nonpartisan redistricting, which you've heard of gerrymandering the process, it's always said, by which uh, politicians choose their voters instead of voters choosing their politicians. When we put these three together, we can change the incentives that are operating for both what they have to say to get elected and what they do. And one final one in re-engineering the election machinery, to get that independent presidential candidate or a third party candidate, we need to change one more rule, which is the debate access rules. Because right now the debate access rules ensure that no one is gonna be on that de debate stage who isn't a Democrat or a Republican. And there's lawsuits going on about that right now. So just to stick on this for one second, because I'm not sure that everybody understands this. So this is something, actually, it has to be done state by state, right? Every state determines its rules. A couple of states have actually started to change. And, you know, but a lot of the things that have happened, when we say we've had a gridlocked Congress, a lot of the things that have happened have happened state by state. Where, so is there a national campaign or something? And could you just talk very briefly how could this change, you know, ballot or the state legislature? What are, what are the ways that we could get to this achievable? Correct. So the Constitution delegates to the states the ability to make all these rules about how they will elect their representatives, and so the state legislature or the state constitution has to be changed. You've got three ways to do that first, as Alan indicated, a ballot initiative. So oh, I think it's 26 states or so have the option of the citizens actually going to the you know, poll, polling booth and voting for this kind of change. And that's the referendum. California has that referendum, and that's how they delivered a, a one stage of these reforms here. The second option you have in the states that don't have referendum is to actually get the legislature, both houses in all those states, and the, and the governor to pass and then sign into law this legislation. And the third option is legal action. And we've seen a lot of the progress in nonpartisan redistricting sort of coming through the courts. So each state is going to need a group of concerned citizens who comes together to move the reforms forward according to a strategy that is designed for the both the legal and constitutional realities of their state, but also the political, on-the-ground, state-level realities of getting these reforms passed. So, Jason, let me turn to you on a couple of things for you to touch on here. One, you know, it, it, it strikes me that the, what you were saying before, actually strengthening the parties, but strengthening their ability to vote for the things they want to do without thinking that they couldn't vote for that without angering the, mm -hmm. the wings. Does this kind of change give it a chance for more moderates mm -hmm. to go through the general than, than having yeah. to be out primaried, yeah. number one? And number two, I wanted to ask you something about, about money in politics because, well, I agree it's not the major issue now. The one thing that I think it's, it's, it's the fact that now, you said the unintended consequences of, you know, basically outside parties being able to spend whatever they want. The money spent on congressional elections is no longer mostly in that county or in that, you know, state or in that city where the money is raised. Now it's national money can be driving the same issues over and over every place in the country and inflaming this kind of partisanship. So I don't know if you want to touch yeah, on I'll that a little. Yeah, I'll try to, ooh, now I get like, like Barry guys. White now. This is great. <laughs> um, so, I mean, big picture, like, I think this is great, all right? Th these are um, really interesting experiments, but we have to acknowledge that they're experiments. We have a little bit of data in California, in Washington, and thus far, I think it's fair, and maybe Catherine would disagree, it's the kind of jury's out. Right, so one of the imaginations about nonpartisan primaries is that it'll bring more turnout because you'll have more candidates who reflect the interests of what we hope to be the responsible middle of the party. Thus far, that hasn't happened, um, partly because when you have two Democrats running, Republicans don't really give a damn. And when you have two Republicans running, Democrats don't really feel like they have an investment there. So there's some risk, in fact, that by kind of taking politics out of politics, people get a little bored. Um, you also have the potential that everything gets gamed. So there's a concern now in California with all of the enthusiasm in the Democratic Party 
that while you have clearly strong, you know, democratic energy and majorities, you could see a situation with they have a top two, which I'm sure is why you're and right now they have and top that's two part candidates. Of why the top four is so I get like you know, but so you could have a situation where even in California, you could have the Democrats split the ticket and you could have just Republicans running. And so if you move from two to four, you can probably change. I mean, so it's really cool stuff, right? I'm not like the system's not good. So I'm a pretty you know risk taking when it comes to trying some new things out. I'm just always a little suspicious of, again, trying to put a rational, frankly, kind of business school case on a process that is not a business. If you want to run politics like a business, check out China. Works really well. That's not the spirit of our democracy. Um, on the question of money, money is going to flow through our politics. Whether we love it or not, um, the First Amendment's really inconvenient in lots and lots of different ways. And, you know, I am not a big fan, as neither is Catherine, of a constitutional convention. When you open up the Constitution, you open the whole damn thing up, not just the parts you don't like. I'll stick with what they did. No disrespect, Senator, to the folks back in the 1780s. Um, I just think we need to be careful that in our kind of zeal to make things work better, we don't over-design a system that then becomes so brittle that it can work worse. And that's, I think, been the story thus far of money and politics. I am a strong supporter of transparency. I think the idea that we have the kind of dark money flowing to the edges, I mean, the, much as we like to denigrate the parties, they are the grown-ups in the room right now. I mean, no matter what you want to say about Debbie Wasserman Schultz or Reince Priebus, they could not have run the ads that we saw in the last campaign that were run by groups like Mothers for America and Americans for Mothers. And you have no idea who these groups are, and they're writing just absolutely vicious, disgusting attacks with absolutely no accountability. So. You know, I appreciate the notion that we want kind of power to the people. I certainly would like that too. But I see what happens when you run states by referenda. And that's not worked very well here in California. And I'm aware of the situations in which past really well-intended efforts have actually made the system less functional. And so I just think we have to go into this with a certain amount of kind of humility and caution when we decide that there's, you know, a single fix that's going to make the country work better. So, Patrick. Oh, I, would, I would just observe that... Um, you know, the, the media industry has gone through an, an, an extraordinary transformation over the, the past 15 years. When, when we started Politico 11 years ago, the first two years, 80% of our revenue came from our print uh, uh, newspaper, right? Today, that it's, it's, it's a fraction of that. And so, a, as you think about media companies that are sort of covering the politics and policy of the United States, um, doing that in a business model that is sustainable um, has been something that a lot of companies have struggled with. We, we went, uh, f from our perspective, our belief was that, um, and every media company has to pick its editorial strategy, but our strategy was credible, reliable, trustworthy, nonpartisan, and that there was an audience of people and I think they're here at the Milken Conference. These are people that care, understand that we're in a very disrupted uh, uh, point globally, that um, there are transformative technologies and other aspects of our life that are, that are really changing, and people are thinking deeply about finding solutions to those problems. Our solution to that problem was to actually go deeper on policy. We cover 16 policy verticals, literally agriculture, education, healthcare, energy, and there is a big audience of people, not just here in the United States, but in Europe, um, that really do care about these important policy issues. And I think they reflect uh, a lot of the people that I've met here at the Milken Conference over the last, uh, over the last 24 hours. So I, I do think um, I, I, I'm not, you know, the right guy to opine on, on, on you know, uh, sort of how to solve partisan gridlock. But I can tell you that there is a big audience of people that care about facts and policy and care about having a media that is actually delivering high-quality journalism. So, uh, you know, people start with a bias and then they go to the biased media to find out why their bias is right, um, and, and it's a, a, a circle. And then, then, Bob, you know, talking about campaign finance a little bit, just a couple of aspects of it. One of the things I've said for a long time is, you know, maybe the worst part of money is it may balance each other out, but the amount of time that we basically, we hire people to go do a job, like be a senator, be a congressman, even be a president, the amount of hours that they have to spend to raise the money to keep their job versus actually do their job is, has grown exponentially over the years. Um, and so, you know, the other aspect of what I'd like to talk about, the way the media starts this stuff, one of the things that's been interesting, you find that most 
voters say that they don't like negative political ads. Most voters say they really don't like negative political ads. Yet all the people that look at what has an impact and actually gets people out to vote are negative ads. Mm -hmm. And so as we, you know, as we talk about, even though the money seems to balance each other out, but in an odd way, it's like the duopoly. The money is sort of saying the main thing we have to do, and you and I have talked about this before, is we just got to make sure that we tell people that we'll keep those others from getting in because they're really bad and they're, you know, we, we need to protect you from them. So is there anything you could possibly see that would get through the Supreme Court that would change this dynamic of this sort of keep driving people to hate the other side? So um, I never thought I was going to run for a third term. So, you know, I spent, so you didn't have to I raise spent money. no time raising any money. Right. I, you know, last March, uh, my staff said, well, at least let's keep the option open. So we did a little bit of it. But I always thought that, I know this is counter to most people, that me having to go sit in front of somebody and convince them that I was worthy of them investing $1,000 in a campaign in was a, a process that actually made some sense, I'm sorry, that I had to sell myself to that person. You think about what's happening today, um, people don't care so much about money anymore. By the way, the money that to me is, is the problematic is the mass of money that comes in that has no connection whatsoever to Correct. the candidate, right? right? I mean, you know, now candidates, as you know, are setting up super PACs. That's really the same, but that, that super PAC, is different from them and so they can run some of these crazy ads that were alluded to a minute ago the bigger piece to me that is the social media component where news organizations think you know a story's trending when really it's a bunch of bots made up to keep make a story trending and then politico and others uh, new york times wall street journal feel like they're the losing out on something and all of a sudden, they start printing piece of it. Then when it's printed, then it's on television. I think that is actually a scarier piece yeah. than the money piece is. I really do. And so is there something that can keep, what was, it, what was you want to keep out of politics? What was the last statement? The, well, is there a way to reform the way money comes in? And I, I know there's always the unintended consequences of whatever you reform, but do you see anything out there that would change that dynamic? So, again, I'm being slightly rhetorical. As I watch uh, candidates out there who are able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars by not talking to a soul directly, mm. but you have these movements on social media, I don't know. Which is more dangerous? Mm. Which? Is it having to go sit down in front of people is it going to someone's home and talking to 100 people and raising money? Or is it this, this big movement thing that's driven by m much non-fact right. that creates lots of money coming in? So I don't know. I don't know that I have no, an idea to cause no, money I, I, uh, to not be an effect. I actually thought I'd ask you because I've thought about it a lot and I can't see the answer. Yeah. And it just yeah. seems to be a, a, a cycle. But yeah. Catherine, I was going to ask you something else. But comment on this. Yeah, first. let me comment on the money here for a moment. Um, I think the points that you're making are, are truly uh, important to what's going on, like with social media. One of the things that we did, though, in our strategy is to separate into powerful and achievable, specifically so that we looked to say, if it is social media, can we do anything about that? And it turns out we didn't put it in the achievable bucket. We don't have a point of leverage to change what's happening in social media or to change the needs of the media to respond to what the consumer wants from media. So we just said, well, that probably is an issue. And we don't have a point of leverage there, so let's not include it in the strategy. Now, if we hadn't found really powerful, substantive reforms and innovations that are at that intersection of powerful and achievable, well then, I'd spend the rest of my life trying to figure out about social media, but let's try the stuff that we can do something about at that intersection, and specifically on money, I'll say here's how you get money out of politics. You reduce the return on investment that is pretty guaranteed 
to the investor putting money in for self-interest when you have no competition and only a duopoly and they know the outcome of the election in that gerrymandered district. You take money out of politics without changing the rules and the people who are using the system for self-interest will be happy for it to cost them 10 times less to get the same results that they currently get, but it won't change the incentives, it'll just make it cheaper. I, if uh, I could say one well thing. Well, they always say turnout's more powerful than anything right now, but. But I, to think that this is what drives me Saying. So somebody gives you a check for $2,400. I don't even know what the limits are because I hadn't had had raising money. $2,700. <laughs> Alan knows. So somebody, somebody, yeah, you've been asked by a lot of candidates, I'm sure. But so somebody gives you a check for $2,700 or $5,400 for the primary and the general election. Are you kidding me? You think that somehow is going to affect? No. That doesn't I'm, and But people think that. I know. Or a PAC gives you five grand or 10 grand you think that's going to affect the way you vote that's ridiculous and the people that believe that are just living in la la land okay these races right. are 25 million bucks or whatever right. sure you'd like to have the some or 50 million Th that has zero zero effect on how people vote no and, uh, and look i believe that the, the the real power of money now as i'm saying is instead of having to get people in a district to support a candidate and you said spend some time explaining why you want to support me is different from now money going to every race that they think that a key issue could be decided by making sure they win the primary in all these districts that's where the money's having an impact is on that yeah stirring up the anger in the base in every one of these somebody districts. putting 10 million in a super exactly. pack in exactly. tennessee to affect an outcome it, exactly. there that that has a huge exactly effect. i was going to touch on something about well, well, I know, we don't have a ton of time we can talk about a lot of things and i think there's there's nothing more important than elections but close second is what happens when the members of congress actually get to washington and i just if we could just at least acknowledge a couple of those dynamics because some of them are also i think somewhat counterintuitive you know we have this notion that members of Congress should solve problems in a way that has nothing to do with the way people actually solve problems. So our view is that we want government to have you know, constant transparency. All decisions should be made in open forum. If members of Congress spend any time in a room, smoke or not smoke, um, it's somehow you know, undermining the imagination of democracy. And the only problem with this is it has absolutely nothing to do with the way human beings solve problems. Right. So, you know, just bring it to your own life for a moment. You know, my wife and I occasionally have a little argument about whose in-laws we visit uh, over the holidays. It would be a very different conversation if the in-laws were in the room. <laughs> when you think about the ways in which you venture a creative idea or take a personal risk, you have to have some little trust. cushion and trust. And so we've lost a lot of that in the system. And we've lost a lot of it, again, through, you know, well-intended reform. We make it hard for members of Congress to take trips together. You know, folks don't live in Washington anymore, and that's not going to change. In fact, it's kind of icky, but a lot of members actually sleep on their couches. And I'll tell you, occasionally I'll be sitting in a member of Congress's office on a couch wondering exactly <laughs> who spent the night. Um, <laughs> but that aside, we have to find ways to actually enable and encourage members to spend time together. Spending less time raising money would be tremendously important. Now, counterintuitively, that argues to slightly increase the limits, not in fact decrease the limits. If we decrease the limits, guess what? They're going to spend more time raising money because there's an existential threat of a $10 million super PAC that they're going to have to defend themselves against. And I guess I would just close this little um, welcome to Washington soliloquy um, <laughs> with the notion that transactions are good things. So again, I hope my wife is watching, but um, you know, this year we visited her in-laws in Chicago for Christmas and she did the taxes. That was a great transactional relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and again, if you want to get anything done, you have to be willing to give and take. And uh, you know, you will, uh, if you want to understand the power of earmarks, take a look at the Civil Rights Act, which was that beautiful split. We have a Civil Rights Act because there is a NASA research center in Purdue University. Because when Charlie Halleck, the minority leader, needed to help Lyndon Johnson get the bill through the Democratic House Rules Committee, where it was going to die yet again, Johnson finally said, Charlie, what the heck do you need? And after hemming and hawing, he indicated that he thought it'd be great if NASA would build a research center at his beloved Purdue University. My guess is that southwestern Indiana is not, in fact, the best place to study the cosmos, but not a bad deal for America. 
And so I think just the willingness to just exhale a little bit and remember what it means to bring coalitions together is part of what it's going to take if we want the democracy to actually serve our interests, not just our imagination of how democracy is supposed to work. So on the point of a, of a forcing function, I'll let you speak if you'd like, Patrick. I, I, I just want to ask this because uh, another group I'm involved with is called No Labels, where this whole partisanship, there's a group of congressmen from both sides of the aisle saying, we're going to get together as a group. We're going to have 20 Democrats, 20 Republicans. We're going to agree on some policies that we're willing to say we will stand behind and vote together to try and force some policy discussions to be able to say at least something can start to be bipartisan. I know, Catherine, I know in your report, you thought about a shorter term thing while we talk about structure, and maybe any of you would like to speak about this, is, is that if we could get a key group of senators that could be swing and say, look, on certain issues, we'll get together. I know it's been tried before, but we'll, we'll vote as a, a block so that not one party or the other knows they could get something done without us agreeing to it. Does anybody have any thoughts on whether that could help be a bit of a tipping point to say, you know, support people who would like to get some legislation yeah, done? It'd be, it'd be fantastic. And it, and it happens more than you think on particular issues, right? There's not a group of nine moderates who vote as a block. But, you know, there was a Monty Python skit about whether the parrot was dead or sleeping. Democracy is sleeping, all right? It's not dead. In fact, they are passing legislation more than you might imagine, not on the massive stuff, but on, you know, fixing No Child Left Behind and dealing with the NSA wiretapping and addressing FDA reform and cures. I mean, there are groups of legislators who, in fact, are doing that. But it would be fantastic if there was a block of, you know, purple senators who were able to tilt the balance back and forth more than there is right now. I was... I yeah. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm just I'm, we only have a couple m minutes left. I want to just throw a, you know, an idea out that we haven't talked about. But um, I see uh, former Congressman Jane Harmon is here. We, we, we have about 20% of our members of Congress are women. Uh, I don't have, you know, I'm not here to come up with solutions, but just another observation. Um, I, it's been stuck at 20% for a long time, way too long. And um, as you think about that, um, that is, like, th this is one of those years where um, we think, uh, based on the research that we're doing, 10 times the number of women candidates are going to be running across the United States for Congress and, and, and for state offices. Mm -hmm. and, and that could be a complete game changer, just in terms of, I'm not suggesting that Catherine and Michael Porter's piece and redistricting and things around campaign finance are, 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 um, are, are bad ideas. I think they're probably interesting ideas. But they're, they're clearly what's happening is not working. We've got nine committee chairmen resign, uh, you know, uh, stepping down. Really good people like Bob Corker uh, are, 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 are leaving Congress, moderates like Bob Corker. Um, and so th this is going to be a really interesting election year. And, and by the way, it's 12 percent for uh, company boards and it's uh, 6 percent for CEO suites for S&P uh, 500 companies. So getting more women into Congress, I think, actually could make a huge difference. We're an organization. Politico is 51 percent women. 50 percent of our management team is, is um, our women. And our newsroom, one of the only major uh, newsrooms in the United States, is run by Carrie Budoff Brown, who's a woman. And I would just d uh, posit that as, like, if w what would happen if we had 50% of the people in the Senate were women? Would, would we make more progress on these gridlocked issues? I don't know the answer to that, but whatever we're doing right now is not working. And I think, you know, this is a probably a really interesting year to see what happens. And maybe we'll have an opportunity to experiment, you know, come next year. Well, if they're all like Jane Harmon, it'll definitely work. That I can tell you. So... But any thoughts on what about maybe maybe moderates starting to get together and, and tilting any of the playing field, uh, Catherine or Bob? Yeah, so I'm actually on the board of an organization called Unite America, formerly the Centrist Project, and we advocate to elect independents who aren't beholden to the duopoly and specifically for this idea of a Senate fulcrum strategy, which is to say if you could get five independent senators elected, and deny either party a majority, then they become the most powerful swing coalition in Washington, D.C., and get them elected or have them be already elected and leave their parties and come together to form that coalition. That's a possibility, too. In any case... As um, independent as Bernie is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Um, so I do want to say one quick thing about the parties being strong. I agree. The parties have less power in their rooms 
but the political industrial complex, which is a duopoly of which the parties are only a part, is absolutely, absolutely as strong as ever and can keep any new competition to the two sides from coming and emerging in elections. And I think that earmarks could be a very good thing. That is the way people do business. But what we don't want to do is have workarounds and band-aids when the fundamental incentives are broken. It would be like saying that, you know, earmarks could be like a black market currency and saying that therefore a thriving black market can actually substitute for a really well-functioning economy. I really would like to see this deal-making ability restored in many ways, but let's do it on top of changes in fundamental incentives. But Bob, the notion of a moderate group sort yeah. of swinging votes is a little bit like the beginning of a realignment of parties, as we talked about before. What do you think yeah. are the possibilities? Yeah, so I mean, I, I appreciate the work you've done with no labels, and I, I, I have attended some of the hearings or meetings, and, and people... What I, what I, I leave these meetings, and I, I want to say to some of the senators who've said, yeah, that'd be great. Well, you had an opportunity. Right. We right. voted on a tough bill last week. You could have shown some courage. So let me just say two things. I hate earmarks. I hate them with a passion. Um, I, I think you're right about some of the things that have passed. But to have people lined up out your door wanting 500000 for this or $2 million for that. I, I'm sorry. What's happened is the appropriators now have no power in Washington, thankfully. Thankfully. Um, and so I'm glad earmarks are gone. I'll say one other thing. I, I, the parties, I, I see people back home, and they'll, they'll be this leader on the right that's in the right ditch ditch and gosh look at the courage they've got god look at them they're so strong and on the left side look at the courage that person has those people burn no political capital ever it takes less courage less courage to be in the right ditch or the left ditch than it does to be in the middle burning the political capital you have meaning you're you're causing people back home to be somewhat discouraged that are part of these right and left wings but that's where the courage is and I, somehow or another to reward people for having the courage to make a tough vote that is going to make our nation stronger somehow we've got to get to that place instead of holding up these people that'll never get a damn thing done the entire time they're serving Well, wow, uh, we couldn't close on anything better than that. And I, I, I do think the thing about earmarks, by the way, Jason, it's a different world when every one of them can be out in social media as to who got an earmark to do what when people back then didn't no, know. That's what. actually one of the advantages of it. But we'll, we'll have a, Senator and I will have a longer we'll conversation have a longer about that longer in the hall. So I'll, I'll close with this. First of all, thank you. It, it, this was a great conversation. You all contributed thank so much. I hope all of you agree with that. And one thing I've said, and mm -hmm. thank you. One thing I've said in, in previous meetings like this is, you know, when you said politics isn't dead, it's sleeping. And, you know, it's sort of like we go, is that we've seen these kinds of problems before all the time in our, in our system. And, uh, you know, in fact, because it's an old saying that I learned a long time ago from a very wise man, that if you really want to understand anything, you know, a subject, really take the word and break it down into its component parts. And politics breaks down into poly, which is Latin for many, and ticks, which are blood-sucking yeah. parasites. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so essentially, we've always had to deal with this, and we're going to try and find a way to make it better. But we all have to work at it, and I really, really appreciate everybody on the panel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you.